let's pray and we'll get right into our Sunday school lesson here. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, and thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Holy Ghost, you'll be able to illuminate us with regards to stubble this morning. And Lord, I give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that you gave through your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And this morning we're going to continue our studies here in the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to look at the sixth and final reward that we can receive at the judgment seat in accordance with 1 Corinthians 3, which is stubble. And the question is, what is stubble? Because okay, a couple things actually come to your mind. That includes a little bit of the stuff right here that I probably should have cleaned off this morning. The question is, is that what the Bible is talking about, brother? Go to Exodus 5. Preacher says, amen. That's definitely what it is. Amen. Exodus 5. No, I'm pretty clean. Y'all can check me with a razor if you want. Exodus 5 and verse 12. The Bible says. To give you some context, the taskmasters were telling the children of Israel, go find your straw. They're tired of giving them the straw. Okay, verse 12. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And here you see a comparison between stubble and straw in the scriptures. They seem to be in contradistinction to one another. They are the opposites. They were told to get straw, but all that was left in the land of Egypt was junk. It was the stubble. Okay. Straw, what is that? Well, it's talking about straw like grain stalks that you might find if you drive around Indiana. Okay. And you might cut some of these and use them for something. They can be fruitful in some way, especially for building things. Okay. Straw might, for example, be used to make the brick that's laid in order to build a building. But stubble is what's left off afterwards, and it's dead and useless, and it can't be used to build anything. So that's the difference between stubble and straw. It's what's left, and it's dead, and it can't be used to build something that will actually have, I guess, merit. Okay. And Christian, God wants to use you in some way so you can help build and edify somebody else. Okay. So what we're going to see as we continue through this is that stubble is actually connected to your legacy. Okay, your testimony in the near term and your legacy in the far term. If you say, I don't know, the Lord calls you to a different church. Because now you've been ordained to be a, a, a preacher or something. you got to go elsewhere. Okay? Or the usual, you pass away. Okay? What's your legacy? What do people remember you for? Okay, we're going to see that's tied to stubble. Verse 13. Verse 13. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. So even though the Egyptians weren't giving uh, the Israelites what they needed, they still wanted them to complete the exact same amount okay, that they were doing before when they were getting uh, provided straw. Verse 14. And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded. Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? Yeah. And now the taskmasters that didn't do their job, they're beating the leadership of the children of Israel and asking them, why aren't you doing your job? Even though they should know because they weren't giving them the straw. Yeah. Kind of makes you think about things that happen in life when your boss doesn't provide for you at work. Yeah. But what we're seeing spiritually in this case is that because the children of Israel do not have the straw they need to make their bricks, they can't complete the work that they were given. Okay? And even if they could, it wouldn't be to the same standard because you're using stubble. Okay? These bricks are going to be brittle and they're going to break up. They're not going to be hard. They're not going to be matted properly. Okay? For those who understand how straw is used to make brick and all this, all the masons here at the church. Okay? And so stubble seems to be connected to that. How you looking, Christian? First thing I want to show you is that in the context, you'll see that stubble is connected to idleness. Look at this accusation that comes from Pharaoh. Verse 15. Okay. Verse 15. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, okay, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants, and they say to us, Make brick. And behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is thine own people. 
So, you know, for those who understand a little bit about work, you go to your boss and say, look, I can't complete my task because of this, this, and this. These are basics that you promised to give me in order to get my job done. Okay. For example, don't, not having proper personal protective equipment when you're going into a radiation area, in my case. Okay. For those who are electricians or the maintenance men, I'm looking at two right now. Okay, you all understand what it's like when you're trying to find a Phillips One and it's not around anymore because somebody took that thing, ruining your ability to get the work done. Okay, so you go to your boss. Okay, and what's Pharaoh saying right here? Verse 17. But he said, you are idle. You know what, you're lazy. Why don't you go find that thing? Okay, that's basically what's going on. Ye are idle. Ye are idle. Therefore ye say, let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work. For there shall no straw be given you, yet shall you deliver the tale of bricks. And the boss says, I, you know, these are all excuses. Get your work done anyway. I'm not going to help you out on this. You are not a priority. Okay. So it seems like stubble contextually is tied to the idleness of the people, at least from the perspective of their bosses. Okay. How will this fit spiritually with you, Christian? Go to Galatians 6. This is my best guess. This is not a cross-reference. This is just a conceptual reference, if you will. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Because okay. Christian, your boss is God, isn't he? Yeah. And unlike Pharaoh, he will provide you everything you need. So the question is, why are you making up stubble in your life? Okay. Why aren't you completing the work? Well, the Bible says in Galatians 6 and verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, and all these bad rewards are tied to the flesh, right? Shall of the flesh reap corruption. Okay? And Christian, you're considered spiritually idle if you're working in accordance with the flesh. If you're working in accordance with the thoughts of the world and the devil instead of the thoughts of God. If you're doing things incorrectly in some way. Okay? And there's ranges for that. It could be as... Uh, small, at least from our perspective, where Jesus, for example, told Peter, cast the nets, and he only casted one. So there's a lack of faith there. Or God says, do it this way, and you say, well, I know a better way that will attract more people. How about, you know, a bunch of guitars and all that kind of stuff? Okay? You might think you're working, and it may look like you put a lot of time and effort into that, but to God, it's idleness. God, it's stubble. And that can be tied to you specifically and also the effect that you have on others. Go to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. You might wonder, what's the root of people thinking that they can do things better than the way God has it laid out here in the Scriptures? Okay, well, here's a little bit of that. For those who are part of my generation, we were born into this mess, so I can understand your situation. But for those that are in the generation of preachers, you got no excuse. Y'all have the good stuff. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 16 and verse 49, I'm over here in Exodus, what am I doing? Ezekiel 16, one of the major prophets here, and verse 49, the Bible says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride. Fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And you see in this case that Sodom's issue is that they had a lot of pride and fullness of bread and an abundance of idleness which resulted in what we now consider sodomy, homosexuality, and all kinds of other things. Okay? But that was just a consequence of being full of pride, which is I'm going to do it my own way instead of God's way. Fullness of bread, I have everything I could ever want and need. Okay, I live in America, right? I got it all. And for that reason, you got an abundance of others. You got all this free time, okay? And idle hands of the devil's workshop is the saying, isn't it? But you're going to find a way to fill the time. Okay? And you know what Christians do? They like to take shortcuts. So, you know, I got technology, I got all this stuff. I don't need to go knock on the door. I don't need to go on the street, even though the Bible says that you're going to the highways and hedges, and the Bible says they went house to house. Okay? I don't need to do that. I can just skip and just do the Internet. Okay? Now, the Internet isn't a bad thing. Okay? It's how you use it, and 90% of its use is bad. I'm not going to pretend. Okay? But if that's all you're doing, and you're not doing the stuff you should be doing in your local community, like the things I just mentioned, 
Okay, that's idleness in Gaza. Got to be careful. You might be building up some stubble. Okay. And then secondly, your idleness will affect others. Okay, where does that little saying, idle hands are the devil's workshop, where does that come from? The book. Go to Ecclesiastes 10. You see, the Bible was around before English was. Okay? And the English we speak was literally crafted by God himself. Okay? Our current form of English was actually kind of created here through the scriptures. Okay? And so a lot of the common sayings you hear that are attributed to culture okay, are actually from scripture. It's a good way to witness for those who don't know. And Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 18, the Bible says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. Notice the situation here. Okay, It's not that you can't build something. This person built a house, but because of his slothfulness and his idleness of hands, that house wasn't on a firm foundation, and it dropped through. You're going to be able to accomplish things. You're going to be able to, it's going to look like to people around you, you're getting stuff done. But it won't have the rock underneath, and that's why it's going to fall. Because you're using stubble instead of straw. Okay? And believe it or not, your choice to do the same thing in your life will affect everyone around you. Because you influence other Christians. And if you want them to do right, it better start with you. Okay? Just like judgment begins at the house of God, judgment begins at the Christian first who's in that house. Okay? And so stubble is connected to idols. It's also connected to dry and dead works. Go to Isaiah 33. Isaiah 33. We're going to turn back to the word stubble now. Instead of talking about its uh, contextual reference. Isaiah 33 And verse 11, brethren, we got the Lord talking to Israel, and he tells them, Ye shall conceive chaff. Okay, that isn't good. Huh? Ye shall bring forth stubble. So what they're starting with and what they're actually producing is all junk. Okay, that's what God's saying. Verse 30, uh, 11, Your breath as fire shall devour you. Your own breath, the words that come out of your mouth, are going to be used to devour it. Okay. Verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. So in context, the Lord's really talking about the hypocrites that were the leadership of Israel at the time. They were the reason why Israel as a whole was conceiving chaff and bringing forth stubble. Okay, It starts with the leaders. Okay. And Christian, you may not be the pastor or the assistant pastor. But you may be discipling somebody, and all of a sudden now you're their pastor in that way. Okay? And what you bring forth towards them, what you show them, if you're providing them with the proper straw, that'll help them build. But if you're not, okay, they're going to end up bringing forth stuff. Okay? What ends up happening? In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30, don't turn there. You'll find out that many are weak in the faith and some sleep because of bad doctrine. That's, that's the stuff that you're selling. Okay? Now, that sleep there is the sleep of death, in case you're curious. Okay? A Christian, for those who don't know, yeah, you're not going to hell, but God can take you home early. Okay? You can also get sick, in part, for the bad doctrines you follow and believe and live for. Okay? But that might also be the result of a bad teacher. Okay? And so his stubble is affecting you. Okay? And that brings forth dry and dead works in your life. Okay? So now you can understand why the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to see a lot of Christians are going to have a lot of stubble. The stuff's going to burn up. Because that's already what it is. It's dry and dead. It easily gets cooked. Okay? And it's really a reflection of what was going on inside when they were rejecting God's word to start off. Yeah, they got saved. They got that word, clearly. They, got, they were born again. But they didn't like the rest of the words that are in there, you know? All 31,000 of them. Yeah? I like 102 of them. I'll go with that. Okay, the gospel stuff. A little bit about Jesus here and there. Yeah. Now, the reason why God gave you this whole book is because you need it. Okay? Not because you don't need it. God isn't wasteful. Okay? He does everything with purpose. 
Last but not least, stubble is a representation of the reality that it's as if you've actually done nothing in God's eyes. Go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. And Isaiah 40 through 48 is famously known as the section in Isaiah where God is talking. And it's a beautiful section where you can see the glory and the majesty of our God and His holiness. And you find out that God is a straight shooter and He don't play no games. Isaiah 40 and verse 23. You know, everything, man, this is horrible. God is much more merciful I'm just than, than, than we all think. Okay? I'm just showing you what stubble's pulling out for us here. Okay? And in Isaiah 40, verse 23, you have the Lord talking, and he's the one that in verse 23 that bringeth the princes to nothing. It's him that will do that. His own people. Okay? He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. And you're supposed to be as a tree planted by the rivers of water, right? That your leaf won't fade so that you'll prosper. But you know what? God won't even plant you. Okay? You're one of his plants. We ain't going plant you. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away, notice, as stubble. So there's a reference. And you know what? The way to make sure, Christian, that you're going to have a testimony that affects others in the world and a legacy that continues forward is if God plants you in a local church and uses you for his glory there. Okay? But if you're building on stubble, he may not even want to plant you because you're such a bad example. He may want to make sure that new Christians look towards somebody else at the church and not you. Okay? To protect them from you not listening to him. So it's actually a good thing. Okay. And even though you think you're doing all this stuff for God and all this humbity hum and all this stuff, okay, it's like nothing in his eyes. That's why it burns up. It has no eternal weight of glory. Okay. To use the Bible term. And so, yeah, there's all this negative here, but the reality is, can we reduce the amount of stubble that we're going to receive at that judgment? Of course we can. We can literally avoid it. Okay. Go back to Exodus 5, Exodus 5. You do not need to produce stubble, Christian. Because unlike Pharaoh, God is your master. He provided you everything you needed. Yeah. Exodus 5 and verse 19. But let me show you like the earthly perspective here. Okay. These officers of the children of Israel, they're recognizing the truth that their boss is a piece of trash. Okay. He ain't giving them what, he, what they need, but they're actually seeing it. Okay. This might be the first thing, Christian. You might have to wake up and recognize your situation. Exodus 5, verse 19, notice. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. See, they recognized that this was a problem. Okay. After it was said, ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. And so, verse 20. And they met Moses and Aaron. They went to the men of God who had the word of God, who stood in the way. Of course, they're, in, they're not in a way. They're in the way. Who's the way? Yeah. Jesus. Amen. So it's like you're coming to God finally. You're waking up. You recognize your situation. You're turning to God. You did that, Christian, when you were lost and you found him for salvation. And now you need to do it in order to get right with him. Yeah. You're starting to see, wait a minute. I didn't realize I had stubble. I was using stubble to build. But now I figured it out. Um, 20. As they came forth from Pharaoh, and they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge. And now they're calling and praying to God. Okay. And so they're recognizing that they're in a situation that's afflicting them, and they're turning to God to get answers and get a way out. Okay. That's called repentance. Yes, a Christian can repent. Uh, but if you don't recognize your situation, how could you? And that's why in 2 Timothy 2, verse 25, interestingly, Paul tells mature Christians, hoping that they'll help other Christians, he tells them that in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, why? Okay? If God preventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Sorry. 2 Timothy 2, verse 25 is where I'm at. Apologize. 2 Timothy 2, verse 25. 
So we're to instruct in meekness. Moses is the meekest man on the earth, and he's got his right-hand man there, his brother Aaron, okay, who's trying to learn something. But they're there, and they're ready to receive these officers and help them. Because okay? we're hoping that God prevention will give these people repentance to see their situation. They're seeing it, and then the, if they're going to receive the instruction that comes their way. Okay? Christian, you might need to wake up. And God will help you to repent. Why? Verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Yes, you can be snared by the devil as a Christian. Now, we can have the arguments of whether you're oppressed or possessed a little bit or whatever. Does that really matter? The point is that you gave place to the devil. Okay? And maybe you're seeing it now, that you've been working with stubble and you want to change. You know, a brother of Christ who's a great study partner and now a preacher over there at a True Vine Baptist Church in Virginia. And when he talks about his history in the past, okay, when he got saved, he got intermingled with uh, Pentecostalism and Charismatic. Yeah. But there came a time after a few years that he started reading his Bible and God was prevent your helping him see the reality that he was building with stubble. And yes, the Lord is merciful, brother. I'm sure some of the things he did at that time are going to actually be fine at the judgment. But even he'll probably tell you that a good amount of that was probably going to burn. But he saw that he was building with stubble. He didn't have enough to make his bricks, if you will, for his daily task. And so he sought God and his word. And he got out of that, and now he's in a Bible-believing church. And he's one of the preachers there. Yeah? And that's going to adjust his legacy in the eyes of God, because he's, God's the only one that really matters here. Yeah? Secondly, everybody around you, your own family, your church, and all this. And because of that, he's not going to have a ton of stuff. Okay? Charity covereth a multitude of sins. You might be surprised what God does in the judgment when people make that kind of decision to leave the junk and get serious. Okay? Well, he's younger, you know, he's in his 40s now or whatever. He's going to have so many years for God. I don't care if you're 85 and you're going to die the next year. If you do that, that's going to count for something. We're going to see that in a minute. Because just in case you forgot, you have everlasting life. Okay? Don't you? This temporal life is nothing. Okay? God can see past all that. He does want to see you live for him here. And so if you made that decision, even if it's late, but you finally do it, it's going to come. Okay? Praise the Lord. And the first thing you're going to realize is that now the things you do are actually going to count at the judgment. Okay? Go to Matthew 20. Matthew 20. We all have our moment where we're trying to figure this stuff out and grow in the faith and become a Bible-believing Christian, so we're all going to have stubble, well, me included. Okay? I had my stint with Charismanian too. Matthew 20, in verse 6, the Bible says, And about the eleventh hour he went out, Okay, this is Jesus Christ, so this is God, God went out, and found others standing idle. Now notice, he recognizes and sees others standing idle. And this is what the Bible, this is what most Christians hope the Bible would say. Okay? And the Lord walked by them and didn't say a thing. That's not what happens though. Okay? The Bible says, and say unto them, God will initiate and get his words to you to help you get out of your idleness. The question is, what are you going to do? And so he says, why stand you here all the day idle? Why are you wasting your time, God said? Why you get busy and serve me? And so they explain in verse 7, they say unto him, because no man hath hired us. Yeah. It's because I don't have a job. I'm trying to find one. And, and the Lord in his mercy, verse 7, he saith unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Why don't you work for me, and it'll come. Obviously, that's been preached so plenty for salvation, but it should be preached to Christians too because there's plenty of them standing idle. How about you get back in the vineyard? How about you get back in the game? Because the field is the world, okay? Stop sitting on the bench, okay? Or, I guess in this case, you'd probably be a spectator, okay? At least if you're in the bench, you get subbed in and out, okay? You've got too many spectator sport Christians out there. And God says, hey, get back in the vineyard, get back to work. Come on. Recognize your situation so I can pull you out. Stop sitting there and developing stubble. Okay? 
If you sit down for too long, I guess it's going to bother you, okay? Get up. And so in Galatians 6, verse 8, the rest of that verse, we just read that if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption, but the rest of the verse goes, and I don't want to quote it wrong, so I'm going to read it. But I think many of us have an idea of what it says. Galatians 6 and verse 8. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Okay, this is a situation, preacher. Just like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, everybody knows those verses, but they don't know verse 10. Everybody knows 7 and 8, but they don't know verse 9. Same thing here. Verse 9 is so, so important. Okay? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And notice the exhortation to continue. Not just to start reaping in the Spirit to get life everlasting, but to continue to walk in the grace of God. Okay? To live for Him. You can change your situation. You can have a legacy for the Lord that impacts the people in your life and people after your life, especially your grandchildren and all that. We're going to see that in a minute. Okay. Okay. Yes, it won't cancel out your past mistakes. Okay. That's true. Okay. But it will help in the future and in the present. And that makes it worth doing. That's why Paul himself, the one who was a murderer who killed other Christians, he tells you in Philippians 3 and verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Focus on the Lord. Start walking with Him. That's all He asked. He said, follow me. He didn't say, go back up and clean up your mess and then come follow me. He never said that. God isn't like that. He'll take care of the mess. Okay? Just follow Him. And let Him work with you in the present and the future. And He'll even clean up the past. Okay? You might have that moment to go back to somebody you knew 10, 15 years ago and give them the gospel. You don't know. Okay? I remember when you were over there in the bars. Yeah, well, I'm not now. And you seem to know that. That's why you gave me a call. Okay? See? And this gets into the reality that God does not want to give you stubble. He wants to give you straw and provender, Christian. Okay, go to Genesis 24. Genesis 24. God is not Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a type of the devil now. Obviously, the devil is going to make sure you don't succeed. Okay, he wants to put you in bondage. He wants you to think you may go to heaven instead of knowing that you are, for example. Genesis 24 and verse 25. Bible says, she said moreover unto him, okay, this is the situation with Eliezer and Rebekah, okay, we have both straw and provider enough and room to lodge in, and this was to make sure that his oxen was provided food so that the oxen could be used later, okay, and notice that straw and provider are good things, okay, they're exactly what the oxen need in order to have the proper amount of energy to get their work done. Okay? Who is God's oxen? Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30 and verse 24. I think you know if you already are one of his oxen. Okay? You made that decision to become one. Okay? Isaiah 30 and verse 24. Okay. Got over here Isaiah talking about some prophecy. And he says, the oxen likewise, and the young asses, okay, oxen, fathers in the faith, young asses, young men in the faith, give you some help. That ear the ground shall eat clean provender, which hath been winnowed with the shovel and with the fan. And that's the proper food that you need in order to get stronger and to grow and improve your testimony and to become strong in the face. So you can make your bricks right. So you can build something that has real merit that continues after you go away. Okay? But notice, it's not easy peasy them and squeezy. Okay? It required, it had to be winnowed with a shovel and with a fan in order to get that clean provender. It had to be filtered out and cleaned. Okay? For those who know a little bit about DI water, okay, that's, that requires time to filter out. Okay? Distillation isn't instantaneous. It takes time. It requires work. 
Okay. Now what's going on with this shovel and fan? Well, the shovel it has a bar that's made out of wood. What kind of wood are you using to clean out that problem? Okay. The type of wood will determine whether or not it's gold. Isn't that right? Okay. And then fans to winnow and to shit, you know, to sh go ahead and sift and get rid of things. Okay. Make sure it's all clean. There's your tie into some good greens. Okay. Fans can be made out of paper and that kind of stuff. The idea is, to be basic, is that if you have the proper worship and the proper word in your life, you'll have a proper work. Okay? You want to get that silver of the word of God instead of hay. You want to be green grass. Okay? And then if you have proper work, you're going to get, we're going to see in a second, precious stones instead of stone. See? So that's your effect on other people. Okay? And so because God provided you the proper straw and provender, all of a sudden now you have to make the decision to work in your, in your own land. Work out your land, make it fruitful, fix your testimony. Okay? Just in case you didn't know, this body, which is made out of the ground, this is your land, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? What are you doing with it? Say. Okay? And now we read Ecclesiastes 10 verse 18. Go to Philippians 1. Philippians 1. We want to do the opposite. We don't want idle hands. We want to build things that are, have merit. We want to build a good house where nobody's dropping through. Okay? And so in Philippians 1, in verse 20, Paul says, and we should be thinking like Paul is really what this boils down to. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Because this is the land that God has. Okay? His temple's here. This is His. This is holy ground. I want to use it properly. Whether it be by my life or by death, it doesn't matter. He wants to magnify God in all portions of His being. Okay? Go to 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. And if you do that, if you have that kind of thinking, it's going to affect your testimony. And it's going to affect your testimony in the way I'm about to read in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. This is what it's going to be like. Okay. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12, the Bible says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, notice that, not with fleshy wisdom, so you're, you're trying to sow in the Spirit, okay? but by the grace of God, so there's a grace that saves and a grace that allows you to serve. We have had our conversation in the world, and not only that, and more abundantly to you, word. who's the you, the Christians in Corinth? And I believe this is Paul and Timothy. Okay, that's the we there. And what you're seeing now is that they're properly building in such a way that now, because they've decided to work out their ground, okay, their testimony is filled with simplicity okay, and godly sincerity. Simplicity in what? The simplicity of Christ. Get people saved. Paul, with all he knew, he was focused on getting the gospel out. And godly sincerity. Okay. He believed all that the Lord spoke, and he wasn't worried what was going to happen to him if he preached it. Check Acts if you don't believe me. Okay. He didn't want to be somebody that corrupted the word of God, for example. Okay. He had every sincere monk of the word so that he and others that were around him could grow thereby. And this is the key to making sure that when you rest in your labors, that your works will follow you even then. Because now you've influenced other people and they became precious stones that will influence others and that carries through. Are you saying Paul's going to reap from what we're doing this morning? Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, because if we didn't have this, how could we know anything? This is part of his work. And God is looking to make you that good brick. Okay? You're supposed to be his house, the church. You're supposed to be that building that's useful to him. Well, he wants you to be solid so you don't get knocked down. Okay? 
weak bricks are useless. They just get popped out. They don't stick in the masonry. Just come out. And so understand this reality. Let's look at four examples of different Christians, if you will, looking at some of their stubble and whether they decide to do something about it. Starting off, okay, we have every Christian who goes through this. We have a lost life and a saved life. Okay? Your lost life is definitely full of stubble, clearly. Okay? But then you get saved, and the question is, what are you going to do? An example of somebody who had a horrible lost life, he probably puts Hitler, he makes Hitler look like a saint, this guy, is King Manasseh. Okay? Now I put the references here, 2 Kings 21, 2 Chronicles 33, for those who want to look later. But long story short, this guy killed his own children. Okay? Now this is way, you know, you think abortion is bad. No, these, these were babies already, just threw them in the fire and let them burn. Okay? Sacrificed to all the gods. His dad was Hezekiah, was a man of God, so he knew and he willfully did it. He was spitting in God's face. Yeah. So wicked that in the earthly telling of his life, it just says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord and worse than anybody else. That's what it says in 2 Kings. You wouldn't know he got saved unless you read 2 Chronicles, which is the priestly telling, which is the spiritual story. If you go to 2 Chronicles 33, you find out that dude got locked up. And when he was in the muck and the mire, you know what? He woke up. And he realized he was in an evil case. And he repented toward God. Okay. Some of the individuals who worked around Hitler, okay, some of that leadership actually apparently got saved to read some history. Despite how wicked and how nasty they were, they woke up. It doesn't matter when you wake up. Manasseh's case, he was old of age when that happened, but he woke up and he turned to God and God freed him and he realized that the Lord, he truly was God. And if you read, he found out that he destroyed some of the altars that he built. He got rid of all the junk in Judah. He did the things you would expect somebody who's saved and on fire for God would do, despite his old age. Okay. Now, unfortunately, because of his lost life, his son Ammon continued to walk in his evil ways. He was like, this is all just a phase, all a bunch of junk. You ever heard that from your own family? Okay. And Ammon only ruled, I think, two years. You have to check on that preacher. Okay. Got tossed out. And then his grandson, Josiah, who saw his grandfather at the end of his years when he got saved and was influenced by him and others, walked the right path. This is why I bring up grandchildren. Okay. Sometimes it's hard to reach your own kids, if they saw the difference between your lost and saved life. Okay? And you do your best. Okay? But your grandkids are all going to see the good stuff. So make sure you make time for them. Make sure you build with them. And none of that will be stuck. Okay? And Josiah was just as good as David in God's eyes. You can read about that. Josiah continued Manasseh's destruction of all the idols and the wickedness all the way up into Samaria, which is even his area. Okay. Give you an idea. Okay, talk about destruction. Praise the Lord. Okay, he, he looking for the right battles to take. Okay, and so unfortunately, yes, his son Ammon was stubble, but his grandson Josiah, he was strong. Okay? There's a legacy there it had an effect. So we all go through that. And sure, a prophet may not be accepted in his own country initially, but that may change later on over time. Always be open and willing to deal with your family members. You never know when. God's working on them with other people, and they come back to you, and you have a chance to be part of why they get saved. Okay? For your testimony. So we all go through that, but now we're going to talk about Christians who are already saved. Sometimes you might have your Christian walk and you start out, you're carnal, you're kind of messed up because we're all babies, we're all carnal in that way and you don't have everything right. But over time, your testimony grows in such a way that you have an impact on other Christians you make them change their opinion of you. Okay? That's because just like the brother I was talking about in Virginia, okay, you woke up to some truth and change. And an example of that is Mark. Okay? Yes, the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. You can read about that in Acts 15, verses 36 through 40. But basically, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they had a sharp discussion over Mark because Mark, he left them. He abandoned them in, a, in another portion of his life. And Paul was like, well, he's, he's not useful to God. He left us. He walked away. And Barnabas is like, let's give him a chance. And so they were brawling. They had a, had a little discussion about it. And Barnabas took Mark and Paul went with Silas and they went separate ways. 
But Mark changed so much because of the influence of Barnabas, who I think was his uncle preacher, you remember? Okay, amen, amen. That Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, let's go there. This is the end of Paul's life, way past Acts 15. Okay. 2 Timothy 4. Listen to the submission here in verse 11. The Bible says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, Timothy. He's talking to Timothy here. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. What a change. And you know why? Because he got rid of the stubble in his life. Okay. And you know who's talking there? The Apostle Paul. That's not a joke now. Okay. That's a serious thing for him to say. He took time to tell people that Mark was profitable. I was wrong about Mark is what he was saying. And I'm glad I was wrong. Okay? You talk about a good thing to be wrong about, it's a Christian who decides to change their tune and live for God. I'd rather be wrong about that. Yeah. But then you got the Christian who lives a carnal life for the most part, but sometimes they end with the spiritual work. Kind of like Samson. Go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Now you can read about him in Judges. And don't look too good. Okay, this man was a was a whoremonger. Okay? That's me being light. Hebrews 11 and verse 32. We're going to see that he was mentioned in the hall of faith here. Okay? It's kind of crazy. And what shall I more say? Okay? At least most people, the super saints, say that this is just false. Okay. Well, no, he's in the hall of faith for a reason. For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, says Paul, and of Barak. Yes, Paul wrote Hebrews. Okay? That is not a question. Bible says, and of Barak and of Samson, there he is in the hall of faith. What was he doing? Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms. And in his last moment in breath through faith, he prayed to God to give him the strength one last time, despite his hair being cut off and all this, despite everything that happened in his darkness, he ran to God and asked him, God, let me complete my mission for you. And he destroyed thousands of those people, completing his mission. That's a spiritual work. That's why he's here. Okay. Like I said, Christian, it doesn't matter when. Okay. Maybe you wake up just before. Okay, you die in your deathbed over there in the hospital. Okay. And you finally decide to say something that God can use with the nurse or the doctor. Who knows, man? Okay. That won't be stolen. That'll have value. Praise God. And then last but definitely least, okay. Is law. That's carnal. Go to Second Peter two. Second Peter two. And verse seven, the Bible says. And deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And I'm gonna read verse eight here. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. That is basically thou what he said. That is American Christianity. Okay. Unfortunately, they're going to get a lot of stubble. But at least they're saved. They're not going to hell. Praise God. Okay. That's about all the good that God could say through Peter about Lot. Okay. You can read about what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. You find out his, uh, his own children took advantage of his drunkenness and you know, had incense with him. I'll just say it. Okay. Not a good thing at all. That's the fruit he gave. That was his legacy. Okay. But at least he was saved. And so here we see the reality of stubble. You don't have to have stubble. You can have straw and provender to make sure you build a life that has a testimony that affects others so you can receive precious stones to label and be used in your bricks. And so to conclude the entirety of this section on rewards for this series, go to 1 Timothy 1. What's the gist? What do I need to do as an individual? Okay. Well, in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, all you need to do is listen to Paul. Just, just, this is the simple truth here. What Paul said here, you practice this, you're going to be good to go. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying, so it's full of faith, and worthy of all acceptation. You should accept it. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation and the day of sanctification, Christian. Will you? 
That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, on whom I am chief. The first thing you need to recognize is think about the reality that God saved you. You do that every day, it'll help you grow. Verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you see yourself as someone that you want God to use as a pattern for somebody else so they can grow in the faith? Well, if you reflect on the reality that God saved you and you decide to live for him, he's going to do that with you. Just like with Paul. And that results in verse 17, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And that becomes your focus because you're setting your prize on the high calling of Christ. You're focused on your king. And yes, he's your elder brother. That's true. But you realize he's the king of glory and you're on your knees. And that results in a, well, a victorious Christian life. That's what this is about, right? That's basically what it boils down to. And because of that, your testimony among others will be believed. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. Right? People will know that you have an unfeigned faith. It's real. And they're going to turn to you for answers. Okay? And so next week, we'll start looking at the crowns. Okay? And that'll be exciting, yeah. as I think. I like those things, yeah. So let us pray and we'll open up for questions, amen? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, uh, for showing us all these things about stubble. And just help us to recognize that we need to seek your face, seek to be filled with your spirit, and seek to receive your word so that we can avoid the stubble. But that's basically all we need to do. Yeah. And we thank you for providing everything.